Lynn Chats. I'm Lynn Kuo, and thank you so much to everyone who's here listening live as well as on the replay. If you don't know who I am, I'm Lynn Kuo, and I play as assistant concertmaster of the National Ballet of Canada Orchestra. And I was also visiting assistant professor of violin at the Memorial University of Newfoundland here in beautiful St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada. I hope it's a beautiful summer wherever you are in the world, whether it's hot, cold, rainy, foggy, it's, it's a nice day today, but a little bit overcast. Now, I thank you all for being here. And I also will want to thank my guest, uh, for being here and spending the time with us today. But before I do so, I would love to mention that this is the first of several in violin chats. Yes, I have a bunch of guests lined up and the conversations are going to be great. The next one will be next Saturday, actually, June 20th. And this will all be about being a quartet violinist. This is going to be the first violinist of the Cecilia String Quartet and the Cecilia String Quartet won the Banff International String Quartet Competition. The guest on Saturday will be Min Jung Ko from the University of Oklahoma. And uh, after that, a month, a week from today, next Monday, I have another guest who is the author of the book, What Every Violinist Needs to Know About the Body. And she and I will be talking all about preventing injury and pain and also optimizing your technique and overcoming obstacles on the instrument through body mapping. So this is gonna be the first uh, week alone, the first week alone of violin chat, and it's gonna be very, very exciting. And I have two more mystery guests after that, which I will announce later on. Now, I know all of you are here for my first guest today, and he certainly doesn't need very much introduction. However, for those of you who are new to my first guest, I will let you know that he is a front chair warrior in the Los Angeles Philharmonic he is a solver of technical problems on the violin, and he's a master of the green screen. My first guest is Nathan Cole. Nathan, thank you so much for chatting with us and having a coffee break with us. Of course, yeah, thanks for having me. Should I yeah. turn on the green screen? Yeah, what green screen do you have for today? <laughs> oh, actually, no, it would just be, uh, all I could do is um, light it up. Ooh, <laughs> lime green. I I'll turn it off. So I wanted to ask you, in this pandemic time, I know you're keeping busy and I know you have, you have a lot of students online and you're keeping busy with making videos and all sorts of projects. Tell us a little bit about your current program, Violympics and your virtuoso master course for those of us who, who are not in it or don't know about it. Sure. Those are the two programs that I have going on right now and the Virtuoso Master course you know very well because we worked together in that. That's a, a small group of really dedicated players um, and we worked together for so far it's been a six month program and you know mixture of individual time, small group time, large group time, uh, everybody's part of their own small studio and the people in the studios get to know each other really well so it, it's a lot of fun and um this is we're just about to finish the second virtuoso master course um and then just a couple weeks ago started the violympics which was originally intended to run alongside the real the tokyo olympics and once those got canceled you know, i thought about canceling the Biolympics also, and then and I thought actually, you know, people are really gonna need something to keep them going through the long summer because without the concert dates and auditions, sometimes it's hard to know what to work on or even to find the motivation to open the case and stay in shape or maybe even get in better shape. So that's what the Biolympics is about. It's uh, it's twelve weeks. Started two weeks ago. Um, I broke it up into six two-week events and each each one has a, a fun challenge piece that everybody has to learn in just five days and then record so and the, we just started the second event right and the first uh, challenge piece was uh, by mazas right that's right yeah okay i you, i am in the group i'm just a little bit delinquent in the group <laughs> <laughs> well it's you know there's no uh the eyes of the world are not necessarily on <laughs> on you, you know, and, and i guess we all games. we don't have to all be medal winners right no. Okay. Okay, good. So you're not going to slap me on the wrist for being delinquent. 
No. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, just as everyone heard Nathan say, I was in Nathan's first cohort and it was incredible. Uh, studying with you was fantastic, Nathan. And I'm so incredibly jumping up and down thrilled that you're going to be a guest in my boot camp. You're going to be teaching the people that I have high, I, I've invited into my boot camp, and they are so excited. They're really Great. excited. Yeah, and I hope you're ready for the YouTube video taping because that's going to be part of it. Great. So this will be the warm up, I guess. Absolutely. So I guess I'll let everyone know that if you catch my YouTube channel, uh, I would say in August, um, Nathan's appearance will be on my YouTube channel. And that should be fun. I'm going to cook up something for you, Nathan. Uh oh, I'm nervous <laughs> already. No, you're going to have lots of fun, right? You're going to have lots of fun. Actually, you know what I wanted to ask you, Nathan? One time you were teaching, was it one of your weekly workouts or maybe it was during master class? And I, I almost died laughing because y you went and dug out some sourdough out of a bucket or something. <laughs> yeah, that, that particular day I, I had forgotten. Yeah, I, I woke up that morning and I thought, oh, you know, my sourdough starter is looking good. I'm going to just put together some dough today and, and forgot that right in the middle was uh, our weekly workout. And so I thought, you know, as long as everyone understands that just right in the middle, I'm just going to reach out and give it a turn, then it'll all be fine. <laughs> and I think I asked you, you had a, a glass of water or a bucket of water to wash your hands and then touch your violin. Yeah, yeah. Oh I didn't goodness. want it to, you know, interrupt the flow too much. So. Oh my gosh. Okay. Let's see who's saying hello. Oh, we got Ina. Hi, Julia. Hi, Marnie. Great, we got some people here. I do have a question for you later. We'll ask you the question later, but um, you know what I wanted to ask you because often I hear you talk about um, cooking for your kids. And as soon as I saw the sourdough, I'm wondering, what does Nathan know how to cook? I, I know Akiko had made you some very fancy thing for your birthday recently. That's right. Yeah, she so, a, yeah. yeah, what did she make you? Uh, croque en bouche, uh, basically uh, just a tower of cream puffs. Um, so each puff is individually filled with pastry cream and then the whole thing is constructed into a tower that's held together with um caramel basically oh my gosh and the whole family ate that yeah <laughs> how long did it take you to eat it uh eat it not very long i think to make it it took her a long time she's Aww. a great uh, baker so. and you you must be too then if you're making bread yeah i, I really like to bake i mean bread kind of becomes its own thing there's a can be a learning curve with that, but it's fun. I mean, I think more people nowadays are doing bread than perhaps ever in the history of the world. I can't believe how yeast and flour has been sold out of a lot of grocery stores. Yeah, I mean, flat yeast you can do without because you can always make your own, but um, flour is, <laughs> you gotta have flour, so. Wait a second, wait a second. Okay, I wanna know how you make yeast. How does Nathan Cole make yeast? <laughs> well, I mean, the, a sourdough starter is, you know, it's nothing more than the wild yeasts that are flying around the air, you know, True. anywhere in the world. So all you really have to do is set out a mixture of flour and water and yeast will come and colonize it and start feeding on it. Now, the if you want to give yourself a better chance, you actually, um, instead of water for the first few days, use pineapple juice because it has just about the right acidity to only allow the uh, beneficial yeasts. Right. And then you can gradually wean it off pineapple juice to water and then you've got your starter that you can keep for forever wow this is so cool oh we have some more people hi hi tara oh tara makes bread hi valerie wow i it's it's crazy i know that yeast has been sold out of many many stores here in newfoundland and it's really difficult i think everyone is baking everything nowadays yeah and they just weren't ready for that you know the yeast companies are not used to <laughs> shipping on a you know twice daily basis or anything so they got hit by the thing and then they weren't ready to ship a whole bunch more out uh for quite a while so did you have to buy a, a 20 you, you do wait metric right so it would be for you 20 pound bag of flour um i i had to get whatever i could get you know the funny thing is that right here in pasadena we have uh, a local flour uh, millers really and so it's just half a mile away um but even they were sold out all the oh way. really yeah for about two weeks i couldn't get anything from them and then they started uh putting out more again so they've done very well oh nice 
Okay, so yes, okay, Mariam. Hi, Mariam. Can we ask questions? Yes, please ask questions. Tara wants to know how often you feed your starter, and then back to violin. <laughs> I I do mine once a day. I just feed it once a day in the morning, and then if I'm gonna make bread the next day, then the evening before I'll give it an extra feeding that makes the the levain. That's like the the first part of the dough. So, but maintenance is just once a day. And if I know I'm not going to bake for a while, I'll feed it once a day, let it uh, double or whatever, and then put that in the fridge. And then I don't have to touch it until I want to bake again. Sounds like, to me, it sounds like if you're feeding gremlins every night. It, yeah, it can start <laughs> feeling like you're, you know, it's against you. <laughs> Hi, Jenny. Oh, Jenny Clift is here. She says hello to both of us. Awesome. Okay, so everyone start asking questions. What did you do? What did you come here to ask Nathan? Because I had advertised this as chat with Nathan. Do you want to chat with Nathan? So I get to chat with you, but I would like to know what everyone wants to say to you and ask you. Um, actually, we did have a question that was submitted ahead of time from Marnie. Okay. Hi, Marnie. So the question that she wanted to have answered by you is, when is a good time to use Dunus in teaching? At what student level should this happen? I know it shouldn't be used too much to reduce the chance of injury. Thank you, Marnie. Yeah, I've, I've kind of gone back and forth with, with all the Dunus stuff, um, you know, and he, he wrote a lot and he, he put together a, a number of exercises, but um, I suspect the ones you're talking about are those ones with uh, a lot of stretching, a lot of reaching, independence of the fingers and all that. I mean, I discovered that, or, you know, my teacher gave it to me when I was probably 14 or 15, and that seemed to be about the right time. I was kind of waking up to the, the why of things, you know, why should I practice this or that in this way? And so that was, that was really beneficial and helpful back then. Um, I don't think I was very smart about practicing it. I think I did a little too much too soon, but when you're young, you can get away with that. Um, I, yeah, a little goes a long way for me, and I've I am a little bit less of a believer in some of his methods than I used to be. Like um, which ones? I'm curious now. Which ones you don't like? Um, now I'm trying to remember. I think the last time I took a long look was about a year ago, and I was kind of surprised at the number of things I didn't totally agree with. I, I think those maybe had to do with the bow arm. Um, well, I'm not remembering all the specifics now. And Don't it's, worry about you know, it. It's not, not that somebody has to be a great player to be a great teacher, not at all, but mm -hmm. I am, the older I get, the more and more suspicious I am of people that uh, didn't have much of a record of playing and yet claim to have a big comprehensive system on how to do everything on the violin. So I, I'm not trying to dump on Dunas. That sounds like it's going to be the title of my next book or something. <laughs> oh, oh, that's the name of this chat, um, the unofficial nickname, dump on Dunas chat. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I think that it is obviously great and important to have independence of the fingers. And I believe, you know, what that opened my eyes and my body to was the different types of motion, mainly that you've got motion lifting and dropping you know you've got motion sliding along mm -hmm. one string right and you've got motion going back and forth between the different strings and those three motions you know i had really neglected for example the sliding and the going in between strings and so his exercises forced me to re-examine that um i don't know that that those exercises are the, are the only way or the best way to look at those but um anyway to answer your question i, I think it's at the point where just the normal methods don't work quite well enough to get things fast and in tune when the repertoire gets really hard. You know, kids can go a long way. I think just, okay, play it, listen carefully, play it again. Now play it faster. And, you know, as long as that works, you know, you don't have to complicate it too much. But right. at a certain point, the fingers have to start working in groups and patterns and, and his exercises really make you do that. So you, you do recommend introducing it rather than not introducing it? Yeah, or, or something like it. I think a lot of what Simon Fisher has written and mm -hmm. published, you know, because the, the Dunas, we're, we're talking about at least 70, I forget exactly what year his stuff was put out, but 
it's a long time ago, and I think we know a little bit more about the body now, and we're a little bit more careful about avoiding injury. True. So we back then. I'm curious what you think now, the difference or the contrast between uh, Dunas and uh, Carl Flesch's basic studies, the Urstudien. Right. Uh, yeah, some similar, similar things there. The mm -hmm. Urstudien, I think they don't go quite as extreme as far as the reaches and, and things like that. Um, but there too, like, you know, in the Urstudien, he's got you holding, and sometimes Dunas too, holding these reaches for quite a long time. And that's just inviting, you know, it's like people used to say, when you stretch, you need to do a big stretch and hold it for, you know, whatever it might be, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, static stretching. And I don't, I mean, you're more athletic, you, you spend more time in athletic endeavors than I do. So <laughs> you know, I don't know if you've gone back and forth with different kinds of stretching over the years, but that used to be in vogue, you know, holding these static stretches for a long time. And I don't think it is anymore. Right, and there's this old school mentality of no pain, no gain, right? Yeah. Which... And we no longer think that way. Absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely not. I'm wondering if, if, what other comments have come in. Let's see. Okay. Tara is asking you, how long have you had your Strad? Uh, well, that, since that belongs to the LA Phil, I've had it ever since I uh, came here, which was in the summer of 2011. So nine years, and that's... The, the second Stradivarius that I've had the chance to play on more or less a long-term basis, this one is for much longer because the other one I borrowed was closer to two years. Okay. And this has been a much more positive experience, not only because I've had the chance to play it for longer, but it came to me in a, in a healthier state. Oh, uh, okay. And, um, you know, instruments like every old instrument like that is going to have some problems. <laughs> um, and the best you can hope for is that you can discover what those are and figure out which ones are solvable and then, wow. you know appreciate the great things that the instrument may have wow i i actually was really fortunate i, I got a, a rare chance with my father actually my father uh and my uncle we went to taiwan in tainan the chi mei museum and oh, they have yeah. rare instrument do you know this bank the instrument bank yes. there and we got into that vault and I tried, oh my gosh, I tried so many instruments. I tried Heifetz's um, bow. I, I had my hands on Elgar's violin with beautiful purfling. I had Heifetz's cannon in my hands. It was so loud. It was incredible. It was such an experience. I, yeah, it was quite the experience. But I can only imagine you have it for nine years. It becomes your, your partner, right? Yeah. And <clears throat> I will admit, you know, I've never... I've never exactly been one of those, you know, we all know the person who's the instrument person. They're just, that's their life. And strangely, that's never been me, even though obviously I spend most of the day with the violin, it seems. Um, and certainly I now really appreciate fine instruments, but I still can't pick something up and tell you what it is. Yeah, me too. Um, I'm not a geek like that either. Yeah, I, I don't, I haven't trained for that kind of eye or anything. Um, but it's if anybody's interested in, in some of what you go through when you play a great instrument that's really unfamiliar, um, I have written a story that I called uh, Speed Dating a Strad. <laughs> it, it's about the time I, I had one week with Nathan Milstein's Stradivarius. Okay, that, it's uh, on your, your website. Yeah, it's on okay. nathanwylin.com. And oh. it, it talks about some of the things you, it's, <laughs> Namely, because hey, you've either you've played a Strad or a Del Jesu, or you've heard about it, and how they all don't always sound great when you first pick it up, and how that can be pretty disappointing. So, like um, a first impression on a speed date. Yeah, that's exactly okay. it. You know, if, if I were speed dating that violin, I might play it and be like, "Yeah, weird." Okay. Okay, now I have a question for you. Have you been speed dating ever before Akiko? Before ever, ever? No, I, I never. <laughs> I, I guess you know that existed that I, it must have existed now I think people you know that's just online is the equivalent but okay you know, I, I never did it when that was a an in-person okay. thing <laughs> but it's, blind it's... blind dates I did oh yes blind dates I'm sure wait would you would you be daring enough to share a blind date story with us um sure <laughs> yeah that well you know I when I had my first 
job, and I think this happens to a lot of people, whether, you know, male, female, whatever, you know, you get a job and then, especially in an orchestra where it's not only one age, you know, I think a lot of companies, all the workers are kind of the same age, but in an orchestra, you've got the 20 year olds along with the 80 year olds. And so whenever new blood comes in, right, everybody wants to sort of, um, you know, offer good advice or maybe try to help you out, give you here. You don't have a toaster oven? Oh, here's my old toaster oven. You don't have a date? Well, here, let me set you up. And so I, I had to go on a number of blind dates at that time. And um, yeah, one of them was because this was pre cell phones, um, not to show my age too much, but so, you know, you'd maybe email or do, you know, landline voicemail messages to try to set up this thing. And so it was going to be, you know, at the end of a concert, I was playing in the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra at that time. And, you know, the deal was okay backstage after the concert. And, you know, all my friends, they were teasing me. They were like, oh, okay, I wonder who it's going to be. We're going to hang out here with you until we see who this date's going to be. And, you know, we must have, the concert was over. It seemed like all the audience was gone. I'd gone back and forth through there, you know, 20 times, not seeing anybody. And of course I had no cell phone. Uh, so I was just about to pack it in and uh, go home and then saw somebody sitting really quietly kind of in a corner I was like um <laughs> you know are you so and so and they're like yeah <laughs> and uh, I thought okay this is already not <laughs> I kind of want somebody a little more assertive so <laughs> we did our date and that you know that's the first impression kind of ended up being you know how it was and tepid yeah it was just it was a it was a quiet talk <laughs> was kind oh of my goodness this is funny okay let me just take a quick scroll through here Ooh, so many questions okay um uh wow okay okay julia jacobson is asking you how do you manage your schedule when you're filming and working for both Virtuoso Master Course and Violin Picks. That's a question that I have for you too. You're the most industrious, busiest person I could possibly even think of, Nathan. How do you balance at being a father and a husband and a symphony player and an entrepreneur and a content creator? How do you balance it all? Um, well, you definitely have to use the calendar and put times on the calendar for things. And I, I as silly as that sounds, I resisted that for a long time because I just thought, well, I don't want to fill up my calendar. That's going to be really scary. I'm going to feel like every hour of the day is accounted for and, mm -hmm. you know, I'll never see my family. Um, well, the opposite's true. <laughs> if you leave the calendar blank and don't put down when you're going to take care of certain things, then those things are always crowding into your mind. And then when you're trying to spend time with your family, they won't give you any peace. You're like, oh, I should be doing that. I should, oh no, I forgot to do this. When am I going to do that? And it ruins the time that you thought you were <laughs> preserving. Hmm. So, you know, during this strange time, um, there are hours of the day when I'm just going to be with family and I can do that because I have the other things on the calendar. I think you also have to come to terms with what things are easy for you and which, you know, what things take more time or what things are you not so good at. And that can be hard to admit and come to terms with too. Um, now I make a lot of videos and that's partly because I find that not so difficult. Um, if I put a little thought into a topic and write a few notes, then I can just sit down in front of the camera and talk and play into the camera. That part is okay <laughs> for me. And that comes from having taught a lot of in-person lessons, just as you have, um, as many of you have, I know. Um, writing takes a little bit longer um, planning uh, a, a, a week of a course takes longer. Um, writing emails actually takes longer, <laughs> and I'm not as good at that. So, you know, the, therefore you want to set up your, if it's a course or a, whatever it is, a boot camp, you want to set it up so that you're giving people the most of the things that are easiest for you to do. That's true. Well, in my boot camp, as you know, I, we discussed this. Uh, I'm creating linja sessions, the group practice sessions. I thought yeah. that was great. I get to practice too. 
I get to go on camera with these boot campers and I get to get to practice my arpeggios at the same time as everyone else. I think it's great. So Yeah. Well that's two birds with one stone. So exactly. Yeah. And that, that doesn't take any time for me. I don't have to pre-plan. Okay, let's see. I I want to be mindful of your time. Let's see what um But I, I'm I'm good for now. Yeah? Tonight. We're not we're not in a crunch, so Okay. But let's well, you know what? Can everyone please give a huge thumbs up or a heart for Nathan's generosity of time? Please, please, please. He's been so amazing. Everyone give a heart up for, for Nathan because he's so nice. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's choose another one for you to answer. Okay. Oh, so many questions. Hi, Demetra. Hi, Lisa. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, my gosh. Okay. We answered Tara's question. Answered. Okay. Uh, Mariam says, Mariam is from Morocco. She was uh, she was there for my ninja workshops. Had to practice like a ninja workshops last weekend. Right. How much time do you recommend spending on Simon Fisher basic exercises per day? You know, this is really embarrassing, Nathan. I actually have not purchased the books yet. I've been procrastinating for some reason. I need to get sometimes those books. Sometimes they can be hard to get. I, I yeah. feel like the supply runs low sometimes. So that's good. Good for Simon. Um, you know, every, so everything has to be in proportion and that's one of Simon Fisher's favorite words to proportion but it really depends on how much time you're playing in a day mm -hmm. um, I mean just as an example let's say that you were playing for two hours a day I unless you have really gone through all the basic techniques and you're familiar with a lot of etudes and everything it's probably a good idea out of those two hours to spend 45 minutes anyway on scales etudes technique type work now I, I like all that work to be musical too but let's call it non-repertoire work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um in that 45 minutes you, you know some of that is going to be scales some of that may be different exercises um or they could be etudes so as far as you know whether it's simon fisher's basics exercises which i love or etudes by Kreitzer or Sevjek or whatever, that mix can vary depending on what it is that you need. I mean, Simon Fisher has exercises covering just about everything. So to be honest, you could do all Simon Fisher for 45 minutes. You know, his some of his scale stuff, uh, shifting things, bow arm. It just depends on what you've already explored and what you haven't. Um, so I don't think there's any set amount of time what I like about his exercises is that they all give really quick results. You know, you can do one for three minutes and you're like, oh, that really opens something up. Okay, I gotta, I gotta get on this and buy that book. Okay, uh, let me choose another random question here. Ah, <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, let's see. Here's another question from Tara Guzzi, Guzzi Mason. Um, did you prefer your affair with Milstein's ex or Jack Benny's? Probably can't answer that. <laughs> oh, you, I guess what I will say is that, um, uh, you know, Milstein's instrument has, it has a much higher potential, or if you want to call it the upside or whatever, that the great things that it does are things that I can't find in even in the admittedly great instrument that I play and even that's how I in the story that I wrote about it the very last part of the story is me with the luthier here in LA who who takes care of both instruments actually and okay. he said well you know what why don't we get both instruments here in the same room and let's let's play around and you know we'll call that the ideal and we'll see what we can get out of the Jack Benny and you know, we're trying this and that, and I was getting kind of frustrated, not not because we couldn't get the sound exactly, but because I didn't even seem to have the language to say what it was that I wanted. And, you know, finally he looks and he says, we're never going to make this sound like that. It's just, it's not in there. Hmm. Um, specifically, you know, the, the E string in uh, Milstein's violin is just, it's unlike any other that I've played. It's, I mean, golden really is the word. It is a golden period Strad, but, um, you know, that, that's one of those times when I'm like, yeah, the instrument matters. <laughs> huh. No, I, most, I, I do like to say it's really up to us and, you know, Zuckerman is going to sound like Zuckerman playing on anything, but he doesn't just play on anything. He plays on a great instrument. Yes, he <laughs> and, does. You know, if I could play Milstein's violin all the time, I would, cause nothing else sounds like that one in that register. So, um, 
May, or maybe I'm just saying that because that was the fleeting affair, you know. <laughs> you might need another speed date with him. Right. <laughs> you know what's interesting? You just pronounced it Lutier. Last weekend at my workshop, we had this, it popped up and I didn't, oh no, I was doing an Instagram live with uh, Maria, Maria Tchaikovska in, in Macedonia. And we met each other on Instagram. And so we did a little conversation online. And the word Lutier, see, I, I pause on the word because I actually don't know how people pronounce it in the world. In Canada, we would be inclined to say Lutier. Uh, but right. I, uh, she pronounced it Luthier, and I just heard you say Lutier. Now I'm curious oh. how everyone in the world pronounces it. I know, I I'm wonder. kind of hedging. I, you know, it's like any number of French words where, like, you know how it's supposed to be in French, but you're still not going to say it that way because you're afraid of sounding pretentious. So <laughs> I, I, I think I grew up saying Luthier. I, I actually don't know why I said Luthier. I think it was kind of a cross between Luthier and <laughs> Luthier. Well, I, I don't think it sounds pretentious if you say Luthier or Luthier. I'm from Canada, so it sounds perfectly normal to me. <laughs> okay, we have a question from Lisa. Hi, Lisa. As more of a beginner, I am now working on shifting and third position. Yay, third position, Lisa. Redoing a file Olympic trials it is adding learning vibrato too much to add to that. And Lynn, I am combining my ninja skills with that. Yay, yeah, Lisa took my ninja workshop, how to practice with ninja. Awesome. So the question again, uh, she's working on shifting and third position and she wants to add learning vibrato. Is it all too much to I'll put it all together? You know, I, vibrato should come when you're comfortable playing, playing the notes that you want to play in tune. I mean, I think if you're still, if it's, if it's still kind of hit and miss getting the fingers down, I'm not talking about playing something super fast and everything in tune, but, um, you know, if it's hit and miss as far as playing slow things, finding the center of the pitch, um, if you're having to think about how to place each finger, then maybe it's wise to to hold off on vibrato a little bit because that will complicate things but you know that phase doesn't have to take forever um i mean i still think about how i put the fingers down and i still play notes out of tune so it's not like that work ever exactly stops but i think you can get a sense of whether you can pick up play in third position shift from first to third and it basically feels okay there's some comfort there and then I think you're you're good to learn that flexibility that you need to vibrate notes. Okay, so basically you're saying it depends on your security of intonation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because that you you need to have that that's going to carry through for you as long as you play. Mhm. Mm well, that that totally makes sense. So then I'm I'm curious now to add to that question, shifting would vibrato. Let's say you stay in first position. Would you add vibrato if you stay in first position but don't introduce shifting? I guess it depends on the student. Yeah, I, I'm trying to, you know, I grew up Suzuki. I, Me I did too. Suzuki for all 10 books. I had my graduation recital and everything. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I think, well, I think vibrato came after shifting, but I can't be totally sure. And, you know, I wouldn't base all my pedagogical decisions on Suzuki anyway, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we're I, not poo pooing Suzuki though, right? We're just saying we have yeah, I mean, variations I, you know, of pedagogy. I that's went all. through it and I'm still playing. So. Yeah, me too. I mean, I started really, really late. I technically wasn't Suzuki trained because I started when I already, I was already reading music when I started Suzuki. So, oh, okay. Yeah, I was already and nine. I played for four years without reading any music. I was eight before I <laughs> read a note. <laughs> oh, so you, you, you learned by ear for four years. Yeah, everything was in. I think they would have oh. continued it longer that way, but my parents, so they're they're professional flutists, and mm -hmm. they said, "This is we got to teach him to read music, or it's never going to happen." And so, oh, I hated reading. But, really? Yeah, I depend well, on reading, and my ear is not as strong as reading. I find. But we we can talk about that too if you want. But as far as the vibrato, yeah, I, I'm just not sure. I I would probably put in vibrato already in first position for an adult. I think so. Yeah. I think so. That that makes sense. At least I hope I, we answered your question. Okay. Hey, Chris Still is here. Hi, Chris. Hello. Chris Still, honesty pill. Oh, it rhymes. Chris, did you did you plan that? It rhymes. Hold off on vibrato. Always good advice. That's what Chris says. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Parent of string players. <laughs> I'm sure. Yes, he he definitely has an opinion. <laughs> 
Uh, I think I missed a couple. Okay. Uh, Dimitra, Dimitra from Greece. Okay. I met Dimitra online from Instagram. She also did my workshop. She's a wonderful violinist. And she did your Violympics. Mm -hmm. She says, how to stay motivated. Um, now I wonder if we're talking specifically during this weird time or just in general, because in general, you know, there are often those checkpoints, right? You've got auditions, you've got concerts, you've got new pieces you're going to learn. If we're talking about now when we don't have those things, um, then it can be tougher. And, you know, that is why I wanted to put together something not just useful for the summer, but hopefully fun and sort of fast paced. Um, I don't know, because I kind of need that. I, I need someone, or maybe that says something about my personality, but I kind of need someone cracking the whip and uh, telling me what to do now and then. I'm, I'm, I can be very self-motivated, but often like a push in the right direction. In normal circumstances, I would say going to live performances, um, something that I wish I'd done more of when I was younger. Mm. Um, so, e you know, even now we don't have that, but there are live streams. Um, somehow watching that, you know, it's different from watching a recorded video, right? I mean, it's like why those of you who are here with us showed up at this time, you wanted to be part of that moment. And when you're watching someone perform live, even if it's online, you know that they're, they're basically, they're exposing their possible flaws to you, you know, and you get a sense of what real live performance is. Wait a second, flaws? What flaws? Nathan Colt does not have flaws. <laughs> oh, I, I did this whole Bach on the Road series earlier in the summer. And, you know, sometimes I'd be halfway through a movement of Bach before I realized, oh, this is live. You know, I should have <laughs> taken another look at this. Or not. You sounded incredible, though. Incredible. Yeah. I can't believe you went, went through everything. It was just such a feat, Herculean feat. It's unbelievable. Okay, I have a question here I want to ask you from Lydia Leong. Lydia, mm -hmm. you're, we're going to be working with Lydia in my boot camp. So Lydia yeah, is right. asking, what's your funniest conductor story? This is a good one. Oh, man. There's so many. Um, yeah, so many, right? And uh, Lydia, I've seen on violinist.com ah. um, over, over the years. And, um, oh, man. I'm try it's, it's funny because I feel like the ones that stick in my head the most are like the, the tense and angry angry ones but this is funny in its own way um james conlon uh used to be the summer music the music director at the, for the summer home of the chicago symphony which i used to play and so that was the ravinia festival and so we'd see a lot of him and he was especially great in the operatic repertoire when he's just marshalling these huge forces he knew the music inside and out he could really direct not only singers but players and just bring together these huge productions in a really short time span and so he liked to to move and go and uh he was conducting a symphonic piece it was uh, i believe the berlioz symphony fantastique and there was a moment where a principal wind player took some time in a solo and you know so maestro conlon said all right uh, I, i'd prefer a little bit less time there do you mind if we do this spot again and so does it again and still there's it seems like guys kind of dragging it out and when, when this sort of thing happens you always the rest of us wonder are you know are they doing it on purpose to make a point is it just you know who what what's the sort of ego level going on here and some conductors at that point would have just let it go like okay i asked them to make a change they didn't do it for one reason or another i'm not going to get it so let's just move on but he said oh i'd, I'd really prefer if we played this a little straighter and so we do it again and this time like really plays through it to the point of almost rushing and then everybody's antenna are up like ooh, what's going on and so even maestro conlon just sort of the facade not facade but i mean he he visibly got frustrated and he said um well now you don't have to you know just rush through it like that and the player immediately said oh no i wasn't being facetious and even the way he said it sort of made it seem like hmm. <laughs> There are then this silence, and there's never silence from a conductor in a rehearsal. It hangs there for like four seconds, five seconds. And then Meister Conlon says, facetious. It's one of only two words in the English language that has every one of the five vowels exactly once in the right order. <laughs> All right, let's go on, let her see. <laughs> and it totally diffused the tension and it got everybody thinking like, wow. 
A. What is the other word? I. Oh. <laughs> First of all, how did he just know that? <laughs> That's what a fact that he just carried around in his head, and um, and so we looked it up. What was the other? Oh. I used to know what the other word was. Maybe one of you will know it. Um, Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. No, it was ab <laughs> abstemious. That was the other one. Abstemious. This I don't even know. What is this word? Uh, and I, I used to know that too. I, I forget. I think it may be related to the word abstain. So it's oh. someone who you're the the quality of having abstained from something, but I, I'm not even, I won't swear to that. So one of you guys can look it up. But... The, the, the cousin to that, I don't know, brings to my obsequious, but no, nothing to do with obsequious. How yeah. funny. Um, okay, I, I know that you, you're a busy man and uh, let me just see if there's any more sure. burning questions. Yeah, take um, Okay, BBB wants to know, do you have your favorite ways to teach beginner students vibrato? I love this question. Um, you, you know, I wonder, because my favorite way for myself and for those I work with uh, are the exercises that Simon Fisher puts into his book, Warming Up. Um, and he may include them in other of his writings too, but in his book, Warming Up, he, there's a series of exercises, a series of motions that help promote flexibility mm. in different parts of the hand and arm. Right. Um, there's no reason I can see that those also wouldn't work for kids. Um, but I, I don't really teach kids. Um, so I just couldn't, I don't have a favorite way that I teach them vibrato because I just don't teach them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay. But for you guys, if you haven't checked out um, his, and I, I do have a YouTube video where I uh, demonstrate what those motions are, how to do those exercises of his. Yeah, uh, we covered them and they really helped me. I remember it started to, to develop my sound. I'm going to continue with those, but uh, they really did develop my sound. I, I, and I found them very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I know that we've taken a couple of questions from a lot of questions from the public. But uh, shall we play a little rapid fire question from me? All right, let's do it. Okay. All right. Okay. What's your favorite pastime outside of the violin? I would say photography. Really? Photography. I thought you might say golf or something. I used to play a lot of golf. I have not played golf since my twins were born. Oh, photography. So can we follow you on the gram? Stuff. Can we can we follow you on the gram and see your your Insta shots? Yeah, you know, I the stuff I put on Instagram, I tend it tends to be stuff I've just taken with my cell phone. I, I don't yeah. know why I'm not better about putting real camera shots up there. Although the iPhone has a great camera. So I have a feeling we might see a gallery opening of your photo creations at some point in California, right? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> they tend to just be, you know, I now I take a lot of photos of the kids, but I do try to, it, it's fun to try to make those look good. Oh, cool. I didn't know that about you. Yeah, I used to have a wooden, I used to have a four by five field camera, you know, a, one of those wooden ones with the bellows and the cloth and yeah. Wow. Film and all that. Oh my goodness. Okay, I, this is why I wanted to ask you these questions. Like, these are little <laughs> known. Okay, everyone, let's make the record known. We're asking little known facts about Nathan Cole here today. Okay. Um, sweet or savory? Um, sweet. I have a sweet tooth. I figured it was sweet or savory. Okay. If it was savory, sushi or pizza? Um, I guess more often pizza. Pizza? Okay. Yeah. Pineapple I... or no pineapple? Um... I like Hawaiian pizza. Okay. I know pineapple is very controversial, very controversial. Okay. I have a question for you. Okay. So Nathan, if you were given a chance to fly to the moon, would you go? No, I'm kind of a, I, I'm a wimp with a lot. I don't even like roller coasters. <laughs> um, I don't either. A little bit afraid of heights and uh, just, I'm not claustrophobic, but a situation that I know I can't get out of, uh, a little bit antsy about that, so I'm sure a uh, dangerous shuttle ride to the moon would not be my uh, first. You know, it's funny. I thought you might say yes, but I'm surprised to hear you say no. Yeah, I don't know. Flying is fine. I, I, I guess I've done it enough and all that. And maybe, you know, if I were forced to go to the moon and back a hundred times, I'd be fine with it. But... Okay. Okay. All right. Um, well, what's your least favorite orchestral excerpt? 
the first one that comes to mind is the last movement of Mahler 9. Okay. Which is one of my favorite movements to play, but just not in an audition. I think it's sort of pointless to ask it in an audition, and it takes like three minutes. And, um, if we're talking about the thing I think I sound worst at, the thing I would least want to see come up in mm -hmm. an audition, it would be the Nutcracker, Tchaikovsky <laughs> Nutcracker Overture. <laughs> That's brutal. I play that 27 times a year, and I had it once in an audition, and I freaked, believe it or not. It's hard to play in an audition, and I play it 27 times a year. I, I once had to, for, for an online teaching company that I used to work for, I had to record 61 orchestral excerpts, including all the concertmaster solos and everything. Um, and the one that almost didn't make it was the Nutcracker, because I did so many takes and none of them came out. And then finally I got one that I said, okay, we can release that. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that you don't like it either. I, I, I'm surprised at myself. Like, you know, I play this in my sleep, right? And then when it comes to playing it alone, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so different. Okay, I have a fun question for you. If you were stranded on a desert island, what one recording would you take with you? Hmm. I guess first thing that comes to mind is uh, Zuckerman playing the Elgar Concerto. Oh, I was just listening to that on YouTube, actually. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Actually, no, I was listening to... Did I... Yeah, I saw Zuckerman's on YouTube, but I was listening to Tasman... No, I did listen to Zuckerman. I was multitasking on the computer. Ah, what a coincidence. What a coincidence. Okay, let's see. How about one last question, and, and I won't steal any more of your time. Unless anyone out there in internet land has a question, a burning question, you, you can ask right now. Now your, I'll give you 10 seconds. I know there's a 10-second delay. In the meantime, I'm going to ask you the easy question. Okay. Favorite color? Green. Green? Yep. What kind of green? Um, the golf, like the fairway. You mean green screen Fair. green? I guess, it, yeah. I mean, this green kind of? screen is it's it's a little too intense, you know. Right. A, a, a f golf fairway, but even a golf fairway changes color during the day depending on the quality of light. So it's that whole range of lighter greens. Okay. Yeah. So that was in your uh, Never Miss a Shift video, right? That that background. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. If yeah. One one part of that video had, I think, an actual green golf green with. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that green. Uh, yeah. Okay. Everyone, that's Nathan's favorite color. <laughs> um, okay, BBB, I think some people are asking where your story is available. Published, but the story about, uh, is it the speed dating, the Strad? Sorry? Yeah, if you just Google speed dating a Strad or, you know, Nathan Cole, uh, Mills. Oh, we'll Google, or, yeah. we'll Google it. We'll Google it. Yeah, if someone can put it in the chat if they found it, but yeah. yeah. Okay, um, well, we know, we'll have one final, final question. Um, we know you have many, many talents. Photography, obviously, and baking sourdough bread. Do you have any other secret talent that we don't know about? Um, yeah, my, my friends, long-suffering friends, would tell you that I would always do um, voices. Really? So, like, if, if I'm telling a story, I have to do the voice of the person. Yeah. So your kids must love story time. Um, yeah, well, you know, they've just never known anything else. So maybe Aww. they'll, maybe, maybe when they grow up, they'll realize, wow, dad was so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> or they'll be like, wow, stories are just boring now. I can't. I but, had no uh, idea. You don't do the voices in your videos. No, because I, I feel like I, I've seen the looks on the faces of my friends. But, um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I guess that goes along with any TV show or movie I've seen a time or two, I can kind of like I can read back every word pretty much. Huh. Um, Interesting. Okay. Oh, Jane is asking why Pincus Zuckerman's Elgar is your favorite. And Chris is saying, for example, I'm not sure what he was referring to. Sorry, Chris. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, this will um, be the last, the last thing. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, um, and I think it is amazing playing and amazing artistry, but it's also the kind of playing and artistry that I feel like I'm always in the mood for. So it's kind of like a food that, you know, it might not be, you know, it's a different question than, than asking, you know, what do you think is the best recipe 
ever or, or the best dish ever. You know, this is more like I've only got one thing to eat for the rest of my life. What's it going to be? Yeah. This is, you know, I'm, I've only got one recording. I want to make sure it's something I would be thrilled to listen to every single day. And, and that does it for me. Just his sound, the humanity of the sound and the expression. And I just thought sometimes I put that on right before I have to go out and play. Really? Um, yeah. You, and in a way, it should make me feel bad about myself. But <laughs> I just I I always end up getting in the mood like, yeah, it's like the boxer right before they go out into the ring, yeah. right? They've got to put on some kind of music to. That is so cool. I found out, I have found out so many new things about you today in this conversation. Like, <laughs> okay, everybody thumbs up if you learned something new about Nathan Cole today. I know I it's sourdough. Yes. I eat sourdough and speed dating and photography and your favorite color. I've learned so much about you. Awesome. So, Okay, well, thank you so much, Nathan. This is such yeah. so generous of you to give up your time in your busy life and your busy day. And yeah, so um, I think uh, I will invite everyone to the next violin chat. Don't forget, put in your calendar Saturday. Yeah, this, this will be a great series. Yeah, I hope so, and I think it will be. And I'm really looking forward to you on August third, your appearance in my boot camp. And I yeah. tell you, the boot campers are in for a real treat, as they already know, because you're. You're a superstar, and I think the the YouTube video recording will be interesting. Will be fun. Okay. <laughs> yeah, will be fun. So thank you everybody for paying attention and listening and submitting your questions, and thank you everyone for watching the replay after. So go visit uh, uh, Nathan's YouTube channel. You'll find him really easily, and go visit natesviolin.com, and go check out his Violympics Virtuoso Master Course. Check out everything about Nathan Cole because he's one great guy. Thank you so much. And Nathan, we'll talk soon again. All right. Sounds great. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you.